The next uh, speaker, uh, the topic we will be late is uh, gene-wide uh, association studies. And I'm very pleased to present Dr. Alarcón Riquelme. Marta Eugenia uh, has been working in lupus for over 17 years. She made her research career at the University of Uppsala in Sweden. I think she got the degree first in Nesto Cohorn, where she became professor in genetic epidemiology of inflammatory chronic diseases. She then moved to Spain, where uh, she has the Department of Human Genetics Variation at the Center from, uh, for Genomics and Oncology Research in Granada. She has recently been awarded a prize from the Andalusian government for avant-garde research. She is also an associated, associated, associated member of the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation. She, she has over 150 publications, many in high-impact journals, of which uh, some of 120 are original papers, and uh, she shares the BioLupus Research Network and coordinates the GNR and GenLess Latin American Multicenter collaborations, which uh, are working on the genetic of lupus and rheumatoid arthritis in this uh, population. So uh, I'm very pleased to present her, and I ask her to start with the talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mani. I, I have to say that John Harley's curriculum is much more extensive than mine, and so we have to be very brief about it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Ah, it's a bad joke. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, the identification of susceptibility genes in admixed populations, and I think this actually fits pretty well with what, uh, in a way, covers quite well now what Bob has been telling you before, or what John has actually uh, told you about. And you will actually realize a few things from what he said in the end in, in, in my talk. So, well, I don't need really to tell you that um, lupus is really uh, the combination of a number of environmental factors and genes at different, very different levels of phenotypes that we actually don't really know much about. Actually, there's some of those phenotypes that are probably hidden under those endophenotypes. And in a sense, if, you, if any of you were at my talk at the, for the Lupus Academy, I was actually saying that, in a sense, the, the, the diagnostic criteria or the classification criteria for lupus are probably actually doing more harm than really helping us in defining really what, what, uh, what um, the genetics behind the disease is all about. But it's important for us to know that actually ethnicity, as, as, as you as rheumatologists actually know, impacts disease progression and outcome very importantly. We know very well that the disease is definitely more severe in some populations, which are probably minorities in some places, but are definitely a great majority in very expansive populations in the American continent in particular, but also in, 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 in Europe and in other places. So, for instance, this picture that I, I, I have um, uh, that I have put here, it's you can see from the from the Gladel cohort uh, several years ago, 2004, uh, looking at all the Latin American uh, 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 large Latin American cohort, you can see that the frequency of kidney disease, as you well know, is much higher in individuals of reported self-reported African uh, ancestry or with a mixture of uh, Amerindian. European ancestry, or probably a mixture of more more than that, much more than that, which is European, Asian, African, and, uh, and, and Amerindian ancestry, or Native American ancestry, as we can well call it as well. So the populations in North and South America are clearly very complex and incorporate definitely several continental ancestries, African, European, Asian, Native American, what I'm going to call here Amerindian in particular. So this is just to give you a small example of a patient with lupus whom I know, whose parents actually, her father came from Spain down to Uruguay, where the south is our north, and married this woman here, which you can see, you would say she's a mulatto, already an admixed person, and had these beautiful daughters here, 
One of them is a, is a, is a grown-up patient, patient with lupus. So this is just to show you the enormous complexity of this type of, of populations. And you can see it here when you use markers that actually define the continental ancestries in a given individual based on differences in allele frequencies, which we call actually FST, uh, using reference populations. So we take reference populations from Africa, from Asia, from Europe, and then from the Americas, which is a little bit more difficult to find. Um, and then you can see actually each of these dots is actually an individual. So you can have individuals, for instance, from Mexico, individuals from, um, uh, from Peru, from Argentina, and you can see how actually they're, they are so diverse. They come from this point to this point and vary in their ancestry completely. And this variation actually might change depending actually on the geographical region where they are located. So you can see here some proportions of European ancestry, South European ancestry, North European ancestry, and individuals from Peru, for example, there's a little bit more of a weight of Amerindian ancestry. Individuals from Argentina, where there's a little bit more of a European ancestry, or individuals from Mexico, which are really, really, really in this variation from zero to 100 with a mean of 50%. So each of these individuals is going to be very, very complex. If we use even more markers, there's an increased complexity within the continent of the Americans. So what you see here is uh, what we call a principal component analysis, where you can divide the clusters of these variants, uh, the frequencies of the individuals in their ancestries. And you can see actually this large cluster here with all this variation coming from one side of the other. Here is the axis here, which is pointing the vortex, which is the, the, the European ancestry. And you can come all the way separating North Americans from South Americans. So this is Peru, and this is Chile, and this is Argentina. This is the United States, with most of the individuals being most probably from Mexico. These individuals are falling out of the cluster, so they're probably, we would, they're probably have other ancestries, some of them African, and uh, the, the Mexican individuals, which actually predominate in a way in our study. So what has been done, apart from a number of studies that have been done for different populations of candidate genes and candidate regions, to uh, understand uh, the significance of ancestry and to identify genes that have to do with the Amerindian ancestry in particular, which is actually the subject of my interest uh, in, for patients with lupus. So, um, so the first question is, we, we made a number of questions here, and the first question is, do individuals with Amerindian ancestry, genetic ancestry, if we define them with these aims and we define we estimate the ancestry at, in each of these individuals. Are there any differences? Are there associating with lupus and uh, with the lupus risk alleles that we know from Europeans? And are there any differences where their Amerindian genetic ancestry can actually determine or can be influencing? So this is just a graph. I think that Luis Catoyo presented this this morning. So this is just a graph to show you that indeed Many of the alleles that have been associated with lupus in Europeans, we can actually find them also in many of these populations. But this is just, this was just a candidate study. But also what we find is that the most Amerindian ancestry there is, the larger the number of risk alleles that these individuals have. So we see an increase, a mean increase of 2.34 risk alleles in an individual that has 100% Amerindian ancestry as compared with an individual that has no Amerindian ancestry, for instance, European. So the Amerindian ancestry is actually determining that that individual is going to have more risk alleles present in a way, or at least there is a relationship. That must mean that's actually something else there that is actually determining this. So patients with lupus uh, will carry at least one more risk allele uh, when they have around 40% more Amerindian ancestry. So the next question that we asked ourselves was, does Amerindian genetic ancestry influence the clinical picture? And so in a way, it's yes and both ways around. So 
the set of individuals that we have been working with are enriched for Amerindian and European ancestries. We've been tried to, in a sense, because of other, other work, for instance, that John Harley and Bob Kimberly are doing on African Americans, uh, we try to enrich in this way so that we could actually have more of that Amerindian genome and try to see whether this would influence both in the genes that we would find or uh, in the clinical picture that we have. And uh, not only ourselves, but Lindsay Criswell and Maggie Selding have also done some studies. In green, you can see those, uh, those clinical manifestations, disease criteria, which actually are the Amerind where the Amerindian ancestry, in a way, is protective, if you would say, or which is actually more important in the European ancestry. And I guess it's not really so surprising because you know already that, for instance, if you take Hispanic individuals, Latin American individuals in general, mestizos, you will see that individuals that are more European, in a sense, will have more cutaneous manifestations. And on the other hand, you will see also that the renal it's, uh, it's definitely very strongly associated with the presence of the Amerindian genetic ancestry. Unfortunately, for this particular study, uh, when we were looking at renal involvement, we also tried to analyze sociodemographic socio factors as socioeconomic level and, uh, and level of education. And you, many of you most, clear, most probably know that it's very difficult to separate these socioeconomic factors as a probably cause for why these individuals actually end up with having a very severe renal disease. And we were not able to do that. So in part because we didn't have sufficient data to, to, to complete the study for all the individuals that we were studying. And on the other hand, because the correlation between the Amerindian genetic ancestry and the low socioeconomic level and, and low educational level was still very tightly correlated. So what is our pattern of risk genes for lupus? So I'm going to give you, this is really pre, uh, preliminary data that, uh, that I have gotten, uh, that, that we have uh, from a genome-wide association scan for lupus in uh, at mixed European Amerindian individuals. And so in general, I will, I will not, uh, I, I will just show you the, the, the pattern of the picture. And I will also tell you a little bit more about the HLA region, which I find quite interesting uh, in, 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 in this study that we're, that we're doing right now. So this is the, what we call the Manhattan plot. So what you have is these are SNPs and these are the regions and John already showed you some of this, uh, uh, some of this here. And there's something actually I think that's very interesting. And you know, been talking about the HLA and there was a question about the HLA being so, in, so important. Well, here very consistently and I can tell you from, from, from some, one of the other studies that I've just mentioned where we looked at the candidate genes, you can see very clearly that IR5 is definitely dominant and dominating the picture, I would say. And it dominates the picture such that it actually shows an odds ratio of up to 2.4 in this, in, this, in this particular set of samples, while the HLA comes to second place, basically. It stands then on the side with an odds ratio that's much lower than what you can actually see in Europeans. So, the, 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 the different type of admixture, even if it's admixed also with Europeans, while the HLA is still associated, the R5 gene stands out as a very important gene for lupus in this population. This is something that we actually had done previously when R5 came out, so we have this publication in Mexicans only that we did where we saw actually that in that particular population, IR5 was very, very strongly associated, and you really need just a few, a few individuals to, to a few controls and cases. You can have 100 cases, 100 controls, and the association can be uh, clearly, clearly identified. So this is the HLA region from this study, which, actually, which, which uh, puts together the North American, South American individuals in general. So it's this, uh, like a meta-analysis within the HLA region. 
And what's important to point here, you do have several peaks coming up here, but in particular, this particular, uh, this particular peak over here, which lies within the HLA DQ alpha to DQ beta 2 region of the HLA. Uh, I would like to mention just that uh, the, the DR2, uh, European DR2 associated uh, SNPs that have, that are tagging the DR2 HLA associated haplotype are not associated in this in this, in this sample, and, but the DR3 is, and so, but the main peak of, of association is located, is located here. We have not done any more analysis. We have not done any conditional analysis because that's the subject of some other, of some other work. But it is interesting that, that the association is actually located in this particular region over here. So, um, we have done a little bit more about this, and this is to show you how that mixture can impinge impact in this particular region of the of the HLA. So, with all this big amount of markers that we use for a GWAS, which has around one million one million SNPs that we have, we can also look into what's called local ancestry estimations, and that is possible, of course. With a population like the like like the one from Latin America and, and and Hispanic from the United States, so each one of these lines here are the each pair of chromosomes, and one can do that uh, for each pair of chromosomes by segments, where we can define uh, we use these aims at mixture informative markers, and we can define in segments the ancestry. Uh, the ancestry of those segments. So in red, you have the European ancestry. In yellow, you have the Amerindian ancestry. In blue, you have the African ancestry. And black and gray are regions that are not well defined because this is, these are really estimates. So, and it's very difficult to do. So you have an individual from Mexico and you can see the degree of that mixture that that individual has an individual from Peru where you see that the Amerindian ancestry predominates. You have still some of these blue regions of African and some red regions of European ancestry. This particular individual from Puerto Rico, you can see the red very much dominating. And another very mixed individual from Argentina where you can see just patches all over the place of Amerindian, European, and some and some African ancestry. Remember that African ancestry is still the oldest one, so you will find this not necessarily because of admixture, but many times because of its, its, uh, its age, in a sense. So when we look just particularly at the HLA region, you have here, these are, these, these are segments of many SNPs that cover, for instance, by the class one region, before the class one region, A, B, and then you have here the DR beta and farther off. And you can see once again, for instance, this individual which has in green, in green is, is the Amerindian ancestry and in blue the European ancestry. And you can see the segments within, within this region here and, and what would be some like recombination uh, uh, that you have where they actually have the Amerindian ancestry over here, and then some Yoruban, the Yoruban that means African, African ancestry segments showing up here. And when we compare between the segments, the different ancestries between cases and controls, the only difference that we see between cases and controls is for Europeans, which explains the part of the HLA is contributed by the European ancestry. And it's that peak that is actually smaller, for instance, and with less, uh, a, 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 a less genetic contribution than what IR5 means. But IR5, that doesn't mean that IR5 is going to be an Amerindian or as, as John Wells said, it's found in all the, all the, all the ancestries and all the populations across mankind. So IR5 is an important gene and probably uh, and the risk alleles are probably much older so that they impact through all the different ancestries and that mixture between 
uh, between what an individual already has in those, in those different genetic segments associated with the disease and the admixture here with European within the HLA could be determining the risk for the disease in this population. So it might be the result of the, of the, of the admixture. And Bob actually also showed an, a, an example. John, I think, showed an example of that. So I think I went quite quickly here. Uh, just to conclude what I told you before, uh, the more genetic Amerindian ancestry, it seems that there is a higher number of risk alleles present in those individuals. So as John said, well, these are additive risk alleles, and so they're going to have one or two, 2.4, a little bit more than an individual that does not have the Amerindian ancestry. It seems that only renal involvement relates to genetic Amerindian ancestry, and the European ancestry is actually it's protective, and that's something that Lindsay Criswell has shown also in some papers. Uh, but we are not able to separate the socioeconomical, the demographic factors from the Amerindian genetic ancestry. RF5, it's an important gene, definitely. It was identified by Lars Schrenblum in uh, Uppsala University uh, several years ago, 2005, I believe. And it is the major lupus gene in mestizos, in admixed uh, European Amerindians. And the DQ alpha 2, DQ beta 2, seems to be the main genetic association between the, the, within the HLA class 2 region. There are some associations between the class, within the class 1, uh, but these are minor associations compared to with this one. But many, many more studies need to be done before we can define with precision uh, the contribution of the HLA, uh, of the HLA region in lupus. And it seems that in this population, the risk for lupus is conferred, within the HLA, is conferred by the European ancestry in this population. And I just want to end uh, acknowledging a lot of people that have been collaborating since many, many years, 13, 12 to 13 years, uh, particularly from Argentina, uh, including Dr. Mani here, and the names that you see there, the Argentinian power there, from Chile, from Mexico, a lot of friends, uh, and Peru. And also I have to acknowledge uh, all the members of this Legion Consortium who have been very, very important in this. And I was, uh, already, when I was working in Uppsala, I was invited to the Legion Consortium and it has meant a lot for many of us to be part of it. The people from the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation that have been helping me very much and who have been involved in this in this work in general, and the other members of SLEGEN uh, and uh, the GLADEL and Henless Networks, uh, Bernardo Poncestel, and of course the funding, the different funding agencies. I still have to write about the Swedish Research Council because I was able to move some funding from there to Spain to go on, to go on working. And, um, and I actually didn't say, but I have no disclosures to make. And that's, that's my talk. Thank you very much. We are open for a few questions. Yes, please. Okay, the Amerindian is the youngest human population. Yeah. Last bottleneck 20,000 years ago, maybe. Africans 200,000 years ago. There's yes. 10 times the number of crossovers in African population than there is in Amerindians. Yes. And so the Amerindians ought to be perfect for a GWAS study because the haplotype tagging approach that's used for this, mm. they're especially suited for. Yes. And yet you're not showing us any new genes no. in this. And no. so if that's true, I don't understand why it doesn't work better. Than it does. Do you have any idea? I think it's an issue of power. Well, you have 1,200. You know, we found all kinds of genes with just 700 Europeans. Well, and then you have twice that number, um, and you have twice the number of markers. Yes. Than we were. Yes, but the more. markers, as you see, well, I mean, there are a few new things there. It's not that they're not. It's just that it's precisely the power issue 
that those regions haven't come up to the threshold of significance that we, mm -hmm. that we need to claim them. So, so, so what we need to do at this conference is to send out a general appeal to send Marta Alarcon thousands samples. and thousands of samples exactly. so that we can That's, figure out what I'm this is I'm working on that. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm working on that, yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Alarcon, for this very interesting presentation. My name is Adina Togoyan. I'm coming from UCB UK, and I'm a clinical pharmacologist MD. Uh, my question is related to your comment um, regarding the Amerindian genetic ancestry, which is related as, or at least uh, associated with renal involvement, mm -hmm. uh, even following adjustments for age and uh, gender, um, and the other comment regarding the protective effect of the European ancestry. Mm -hmm. So now it comes the question. Mm -hmm. Do you think we could extrapolate the findings from a lupus nephritis trial performing Amerindians to an European population? Uh, based on Caucasians? No. So, so in, which, in which way would you want to, you mean in general, translate what yes, we know exactly, about the fritis in Europeans to, no, I think, I think uh, in a sense, uh, we are forgetting these populations. The other day there was a talk uh, about the populations in Canada and uh, in Europe. And there was a question here about the kidney disease in these populations. And they said, no, but kidney disease is not a problem, you know. And what people tell me, many of my friends who are rheumatologists and silupus patients every day, they tell you, well, they come all with a very severe disease. And 50% or more of the patients have at least a type 4 uh, nephritis. So I don't think we can extrapolate. I think we have to move further and study these populations in particular. But I think it's important. This, this can give you information about how to, in the a, in a point, stratify these patients, probably just by looking at this. And we might go on by stratifying when we know more about those particular locations and whether uh, segments that are associated with the disease might have some importance for that population and not for the other. And that's impacting in that population and not, for instance, in the European. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Marta. Difference between uh, people from Mestizo from Mexico and um, from Peru? I, I cannot, uh, well, difference in what sense? Uh, genetic. And well, yes, there is. I showed the picture of the principal component. So the more markers you use, they're oh, yes. similar. But the more markers you use, you have more resolution to separate the different groups. That you can do in Europe as well. In Europe, you can basically create a map of Europe with north, south, east, and west mm -hmm. uh, with more markers than just a few markers. So it depends the, the degree of resolution that you, that you might have. And so, yes, they're going to be different because they're localized different. They have moved differently. Migrations are determining this type of things. Now, when it comes to the risk for the disease, um, that's something I cannot tell precisely because we have worked with these samples jointly because we can join them or we can join them by meta-analysis, analyzing one first and then the other one, and, and then put a meta-analysis. And in general, the results are are very consistent. Thank you. Marta, I have a question myself here. Oh. <laughs> uh, is it possible with the data we have now to correlate the uh, prevalence of the Amerindian genes with the prevalence of the disease itself in the different countries in which the difference in the Amerindian genes is different? Um. Um, well, um, no, I don't. I well, we would have to look into. I don't. I don't think you can do that because uh, remember that these are markers that are found in the population. When we did the first study of IR5, for example, in the Mexican population, we found that the allele frequencies of the risk haplotype, which was different from what John has shown, because it was one of those markers that he claims he excludes, um, was very frequent 
in the Mexican population and was still very associated. So um, I'm not so sure I can answer the question right out. Yes, sure, please. Another question? Um, how do you distinguish between a risk allele that is acting um, as its own risk factor versus a risk allele that's working in, because it's synergistic with something else? And the, the, you mean, the, the analogy is NZB, NZW, yeah. or Afro-Caribbean. Where, where the, it's the interaction, not the risk allele itself. This could also be interaction between risk alleles and ancestry, in a way, right? Uh, I, well, we have done some work of uh, interaction. Bob didn't mention interaction. I think he's not very convinced about that. A, and there is a lot of discussion about that. The main reason why is because um, it's very difficult to prove interaction between two genes. You have something that's called marginal effects, and you don't know whether those marginal effects are actually the ones that are going to be causing that interaction. There's people that think that those marginal effects are important for the interaction. I, actually, I did say in my other talk that we should be aware of a lot of papers coming out about interactions because they're usually not carefully replicated. And I think we, we have a, a work on that, on Bank 1 and BLK, two genes I'm very interested on. And we find not only a genetic interaction, but we know that those two proteins have a physical interaction. Uh, and we showed uh, is, uh, uh, an epistatic effect in one set, in one population group, but we were not able to replicate that in that particular, not, not as an epistatic synergistic interaction, but just it just was an additive effect. So this is very difficult to show, and one would like to have a situation where you have the, the, the worm, for example, mm -hmm. uh, where you can really study that, but we're dealing with heterogeneous human populations. And I think there's something behind it. The, the, the Eric Lander has a paper in PNAS where he says that a lot of the missing heritability might be our interactions, but it's, they're difficult to prove, I can tell you that. Okay, unfortunately, time is up, and we, we thank the three speakers for the wonderful talk.